<laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce uh, Jerry Feldman. Um, he, um, uh, he basically uh, contributed to uh, the kind of shape as one of the of the of the people who shaped maybe the field of connectionism. And it was very interesting. In the early 80s, there were certain dam breaks from neural networks into other fields. There was a uh, paper by, by John Hopfield that basically made a dam break between uh, these ideas of neural networks and actually physics. And uh, at the same, around the same time, there was a paper by Cherry and by Dana Berlot, which basically made a dam break between uh, neural networks and psychology. And basically really proposed connectionism, which is basically kind of neural networks applied in cognitive science. And, uh, and also very highly cited and very impactful. He wrote um, about uh, visual memory, so he, uh, he uh, Jerry wrote a lot about, uh, in, in, uh, about visual problems, and this is also the thing about today. And also in the early 80s, there was another paper that actually kind of introduced the binding problem, which was this for the Miles Ball technical report published in 81 probably one of the most cited technical reports ever. And he kind of defined the binding problem. And uh, since then, the binding problem has been around. It has been uh, kind of brought together with video oscillations. Uh, already for the Miles Bolt did this. Neural oscillations had the first big uh, time in the 90s in neuroscience. Then it got a little bit wider about them. Now they are reappearing in a slightly different context again, and I think Jerry will talk about it. So, Jerry, take it away. Thank you. So, here's what I'd like to do. So, I'm going to pass a handout, which I, uh, because. Um, the, it's actually not easy to keep track of the various versions of this binding problem. Okay, so this is the handout, and let's go through that first. And here's what I'd like to do. I'm very much interested in feedback and discussion, but not yet. So what I'd like to do is make us through the handout with only sort of clarification questions so that everybody... Uh, is, it has an idea of what game we're talking about and keep it because I think you'll probably want to refer back because as we go through this, you know, is, it, is it this version or that version? So there's this lovely uh, quote from Wikipedia, source of all knowledge, okay? And it's also on your handout. So it's an incredible mess, okay? So the, uh, the binding problem has at least four quite distinct variants. So what I want to do first is try to go through what the four variants seem to be and mention a few points and then get back uh, to go through, the, you know, in more detail. So I want to go through a quick pass through the landscape and then come back and, and look at the details or whatever details I'm going to do. So as uh, Fritz mentioned, his name is there, okay. Uh, so the, the, there are four uh, major variants of the uh, binding problem. The one of them, which I'm not going to say a lot about, but Fritz could say a lot more. So, on, by the way, there's a local expert on each of these. The, you know, Fritz, uh, Bill, Prince Middle, me, John Searle. So uh, there's also you know sort of local wizardry. Let's see, Fritz, is it going to be e easy to get some more copies made if we need to? of the handout? Easy. Easy meaning asking someone to do it? Uh, anyway. Uh, how many... Raise the hand who doesn't have a copy. Should we share some? Yeah, share them, okay, that's fine. That's, uh, there's not that many. Okay, so here's the, here's the quick run-through. Uh, so there's a version of this which I confess I really hadn't tracked until I went to a couple workshops in Germany last year where this is, uh, as you'll see, uh, a much bigger thing than it is here. And uh, Wolf Singer, who most of you remember, had this uh, story about uh, phase coherence and stuff, has uh, morphed that in a way that I'll explain. 
So it's not the same story, and I'll explain what the, his, the original story, which was in fact Malzberg's story, as he said. Uh, but the new story is different, and we'll worry about it. It's called Binding by Synchrony, and there's a BBS, and there's a whole bunch of literature on this. And it, I have a lot of trouble getting any actual purchase out of it. I mean, temporal dependence in the nervous system or visual system you know, is pretty pervasive. Right? So there's the stories that say it's pretty pervasive. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say a lot more about that. I will say f quite a bit about the visual feature binding, which was the, the version of the binding problem that actually had w research done on it a lot, a lot of it here. Uh, and I'll go through this in a quite a bit of detail. And I would say for most people, when, you, when they think about the, the binding problem, they think about the visual feature binding. And I'll give you, a, a, if it works, it'll be a little demo and stuff like that. Uh, the part, the one that I'm actually interested in, so one of the questions is, why would I care about this mess? So I'll explain that in a while, but it has to do with variable binding. So that was actually the problem that von der Malsberg originally set out to work on. And for the same reason that uh, I do and maybe three other people in the world. Uh, so this, is, this is part of the problem. And by the way, the best possible outcome for me would be for the, some of you smart people to say, gee, that's a good problem. Okay, and, and work on it. Um, so, and, and as we'll see how all this works. And temporal phase binding is going to be the sort of punchline uh, and then there's going to be a little afterwards saying, yeah, but not really. And then the final one, and this is what causes a lot of the trouble, is there's a notion of the subjective unity of perception. So why is it that we see the world the way we do? Okay, and this is a subcase of the mind-brain problem. We even have a philosopher here uh, who will remain unpointed at. Um, and so if you believe that the binding problem is the same as the mind-brain problem, then you get into enormous trouble. So that if you get a little result about like visual feature binding, you've solved the mind-brain problem, stuff like that. So there's a lot of garbage. And speaking of that, uh, this is visual feature binding. We'll get there real quick, but that's a good question. So I'm going to pass this around. Uh, I'd like it back at the end. This is a slice of life. This is uh, an ongoing controversy as we speak in TICS, uh, trans uh, trans and Cognitive Science. And the uh, author kindly sent it to me along with the ongoing commentary and response that hasn't yet been published. So it's gonna, it'll go on as long as the editors will allow. So this is a slice of life on this uh, mess. And so what I'm going to do, unless there are questions, I have one little audience participation thing. There will be a, quite a few of these. So we're going to need uh, audience participation. And, uh, and first of all, let's see, are there any other kind of framing questions? Where are we? Okay, so now we're going to have a vote. Okay, and the vote is, this is try to get a feel for the group. Uh, <coughs> The question is, do you uh, believe, uh, let me give you an A and B, but it's really only, only B that matters. A, the question is, are there scientific questions which are, at this point, mysteries? That is, we have no idea how to approach them. They're just things about the world we'd like to know, we just don't know how to approach them. So, skip whether you believe that. The question is, do you believe that the mind-brain problem is one of them? Okay. So let's say, how many say yes? Okay, good. How many say no? Wow, okay, good. Him I know, but okay, I'm surprised at you. Uh, but let's, we'll, we'll get there, and maybe this will be part of the discussion when we get there. So let's go on. Okay, now, another thing about this that's weird. So I guess the thing you have to understand about this literature is it only works, if you'll excuse me, with a certain kind of tunnel vision. So that if you start thinking about all the other problems that are involved, 
uh, your story breaks. I mean, it just vision and so forth is much too complicated. And looking at this little subproblem doesn't work. So I talked to my uh, friend and expert on the unbinding problem, which of course is the classic vision problem that the image on the retina is a convolution of all sorts of things, and you've got to try to deconvolve it to find out what the hell's going on. So this is uh, Bruno's take on the current state of that, which is better than my take. And uh, this is another thing that he uh, threw in. Okay, and he's a very smart, you know, sophisticated person in the field, and he thinks that. Okay, so let me do the little bit that I'm planning to do on this general idea of, oh, importantly, uh, we know that this is being recorded, and I've arranged it so that the references are on the slides and stuff like that, so that uh, when it's put on the site, you can, uh, if you care, pick off uh, any of the references, so you don't have to write anything down. Uh, so that's what's going on here. And the people who are most famous for this uh, general BBS story are Scott Kelso and Wolf Singer. Uh, and these are a couple of the references. As I said, I have a lot of trouble uh, getting any uh, substance out of the general story. Uh, and if you think about something like playing violin or guitar, you've got enormously delicate uh, coordination, say in the violin case, with the two arms doing radically different things and so forth. So, you know, getting oscillations in sync is not going to get you there. It's just you're not in the right space to, to deal with the complexity. So that doesn't say there isn't anything that can be learned from syncing. And in fact, the best thing I've seen recently is local. Oh, are any of you here? Is any one of these people here? Okay, no. But uh, a lot of local people here do know about this, and uh, there's really very pretty work getting at how it might be that you can have this action at a distance which isn't actually directly carried by spikes. Okay, so then there, there's continuing work along these. So that's all I was planning to say about the general synchrony thing. I don't want you to throw anything quick in here, Fritz. Okay, I mean, it's a, yeah, there's, a, there's another huge story. It turns out he's also writing a paper on the binding problem which he'll tell us about. Oscillations. Oscillation. In vision. Yep. Okay. Okay. So now let's go to the red circles and green squares and all that good stuff. Uh, so, again, uh, Anne Treisman is, is most famous for this for good reason. She did a lot of beautiful work. But here's the story. Uh, this is not a problem in the sense that the mind-body problem is a problem. So people do visual feature binding perfectly if, they're not, if there's no stress involved. And the stress can be of many sorts, uh, you know, short exposures, bad contrast, binocular rivalry, clinical things. And I'll give you some ideas of the experiments that are being done. So uh, it isn't a big deal. The standard things, and I'll give, try to give you live examples of these, is pop out which I'll show you, illusory conjunctions, which I will try to show you, and it may or may not work. My guru on this didn't make it. So Bill Prince Metal uh, kindly gave me a live demo that I'm going to try to show, and we'll see. Uh, the, uh, the famous ones of these illusory conjunctions, if you give a, you know, a brief display with not a lot of contrast, and you have a P and a Q in it, people will see an R with some probability, because they'll take the little tail from the Q and attach it to the P. Similarly, you have a, a, a you know, stress display with a S and a vertical bar, so you will see dollar signs. And there's you know, a huge number of papers on all this stuff. And again, it's only statistical. Some people will have it sometimes. Attention is uh, a large part of the punchline. Uh, Ann Treisman knew that decades ago. Attention is tricky, though, because we now know that foveation, which you'd think of, is neither necessary nor sufficient. So there's plenty of ways of having uh, attention directed neurally without moving the eyes. And it's also known that 
you know, there's change blindness and stuff that you can be looking right at something and not notice it if it's not task relevant. So it's a little tricky, but uh, once you, assuming you have good signal and you care, you won't make the mistakes. It's also true, and people don't talk about this much, that in order for this to be meaningful, there's got to be short-term memory for this binding. Okay, it's got to be around long enough so that you can actually, you know, pick up the object or whatever it is you need to do. Okay, so what I'm claiming is, for this version of the binding problem, uh, it, you know, it isn't a problem, it's just a routine science like anything else we do in vision or other science. You're trying to figure out how it works and you do experiments. And so what I'm going to do on the next few slides, I guess after the demo, is uh, go through some of these experiments to give you the flavor of the kind of experiments that are being done. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. You say that attention is not necessary, probation is not necessary? That's what I said. <coughs> so attention may be necessary. Oh, uh, yeah. I th yeah. So what I'm saying is attention is necessary, but the attention doesn't necessarily go with phobiation. Okay. So this is a pop-out phenomenon. So if I ask you, you know, is there a purple bar in this thing? All right. You know. So I ask you, is, you know, is there a uh, vertical bar? You know. I say, is there a green horizontal bar? You've got to think a little bit, you know. Okay, so this is well known. This is the, the pop, and there are tons of these. But it says that, and this was Anne's main point, that certain kinds of feature binding requires attention in this way. So that's easy. Now we get to the trickier thing, and we'll see if this works. Uh, let me put this down. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, it turns out that uh, I'm not going to ask you to remember. This is an experiment of Bill's, and it has numerical codes. So red is one, right? And what we're going to do is I'll show you some of these. And if audience participation, if you will please say out loud the answer. Now, here's what's going to happen. There'll be a target letter, then a word. Uh, it turns out always to be a word in this case will appear. And the target letter will either be in the word or it won't. And if it's in the word, it will be of a certain color. And red, green, and blue. And so you're supposed to shout out, if you don't have to be loud about it, uh, the color of the target letter. So uh, let me see where I am on this. Uh, oh, I don't want to be in PowerPoint. Ooh, there I am. OK, uh, let me check the parameters. Good. All right, that's okay. So 500 milliseconds, as all you vision people know, is an eternity for the visual system. And if we run the trials, we do practice. Okay, what color, guys? Red. Okay, so let's do another one. Uh, oh, and I have, to, I have to enter it. Okay. So that's it right. What color, guys? Okay, so this, interesting. So this already is an illusory conjunction. Okay, so as we get, if we slow it down, you'll get, we'll get more of those. But it, most everybody said blue, right? So it is happy that. Here's the X. Okay, guys? Blue. Okay, so now what we're going to do is... Blue. Okay, now we're going to speed it up a bit. Okay. So we do that. And then we uh, run trials, practice. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's one. Okay. So you saw. Um, I think it was green, but there, some people said it was red. Incorrect. Okay. So they were right. Okay. Another one. Okay. Okay, so that's okay. So that's enough. <laughs> anyway, so that, uh, basically, I just uh, wanted to try to give you a uh, idea of what the. Uh, 
Okay, so, uh, oh my. So, there's a slight lameness here, but it's all right. So I'm gonna go back to the slideshow, and I have to go to eight. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Uh, again, to give you the flavor of the kinds of stuff that people do on this uh, feature binding version of the problem. Okay, so uh, here are three on this side, uh, a, a three versions all by the same people, and they actually started off, let me say, with an, a model. So they have a little connectionist model that suggests that um, even if you have multiple features, a bunch of them that you have to bind together, it's not implemented in the brain by some n-way combination. It's a, a collection of pairwise com combinations. Perfectly good hypothesis. It might be right, might not be right. Uh, and they set out to try to test it. And so what they did is they stressed it by binocular rivalry. Good way to do that. So they had a basic display you can read, three features, and if they put all three contrasting features, uh, the system overloaded and it got binocular rivalry and it saw only one or the other and it would flip. If they had a single contrasting attribute, you, it was, you, you didn't get anything real clear perception, etc. The important point from their point of view, if you had paired attributes, it behaved more or less the same as it did when you had three. A second experiment, they had three successive, so 94 milliseconds, as we already know, is pretty fast. And if you have three uh, separate images with two attributes, if, of course, if the same for both eyes, there's no rivalry and they saw three consecutive objects, in a rivalry condition, the people sort of half the time blended them. So it took some of the features from this one eye and the other eye and saw a, a clear image that had all three features. So they would argue that's evidence for the binary combination story. Could be. Okay, so that's the flavor of this experiment. More? So three more on this slide. Uh, again, here we get our simple objects. And the main manipulation here was separating the color from the figure, either a little bit in space or a little bit in time. Okay, and of course it, it decreases performance, uh, but not all that much. And then they tried a, a concurrent task of counting backwards, and it interfered more with the base operation than it did with either of the other ones, which of course were already somewhat slower. This one is related in a way. So another thing you could do is use MRI experiments. So I'm giving you the flavor of you know, the stuff people do. And so you had people doing more or less the same task. Okay, so you're trying to decide, you know, is, is this uh, triangle red or not when the uh, color is displaced either in space or time. And the nice result is that when it was displaced in space, you got a significant, uh, you know, MRI effects in parietal cortex and even in the part of parietal cortex which they believe is right. And if it's a temporal offset, you didn't. Okay, again, standard kind of thing. Here's a nice one. Uh, suppose you move your eyes. Okay, you're, you know, you're instructed to move your eyes. Does the color, let's say, bind to the old position or the new position? Answer's both. That is, there, there are statistically significant effects on both. Okay, and their claim, which might be right, is that the, uh, you've got two visual pathways and they are both in business and some of the effect happens in each of the pathways. I don't know. But again, this is more of the kind of thing people are doing. My main point is that this is perfectly routine visual science of trying to work out the details of how this works. No mystery whatsoever as far as I can tell. Nothing like one. Okay, final of these experiments is actually uh, one of Ann Treisman's recent experiments and this is the same figure I showed you before, but in this case, there were uh, six uh, plus signs, so you can look at, uh, you know, this sort of collection of them here. 
and they either had a vertical or a horizontal colored bar and the subjects had to report the color and the orientation of a particular one. So there were six of them and one of them, oh maybe this one, would be masked, marked by four surrounding dots. Okay, this is again a very well-known manipulation. And what they did is very nice. Uh, so if you did that and you gave people enough time, they would get it. But if you uh, did this trick, trailing mask trick, it's this thing. Okay, so you have the uh, image stay on for a couple hundred milliseconds, but you have this mask stay on for 300 milliseconds longer. So what that uh, is believed to do is to break up any feedback loops that would be used in the binding. And so what they found is that uh, when you did that, first of all, you significantly reduced the orientation accuracy. Second of all, related to an earlier thing, if someone knows in advance where this is going to happen, then you don't get that effect. So there's six choices. You do get the effect if you, if you know it's always going to be in such and such or they rotate or whatever it is. If you know where it's going to happen, the uh, trailing mask doesn't wipe out your ability to do feedback. And if there's a single bar as before, um, you know, you get no effect. Okay, so that's all I'm planning to do on this, at least until we summarize. I'm going to go on to the problem I really care about, which is the variable binding problem. Okay, so, okay, I'm, I just looked at your watch. It's, I got it, I got it. Okay, I have one somewhere, but anyway. So, uh, so this is the one that uh, I really care about, and the one that uh, Malzberg cared about, and so forth. And it, it's important because uh, if we're ever going to build neural models or neural explanations of complex behavior, language, and problem solving and stuff, we've got to solve a different kind of binding problem. And by the way, if anybody has a better term for this problem, that would be great because if you some, say something's a kind of binding problem, you get in this field of noise, right? And it's very hard to get anyone to understand what you're talking about. So, uh, typical th things, uh, this is mainly symbolic, but it's true if, if you see some strange shaped object that you've never seen before and you want to pick it up, the visual system has to convey to the motor system a whole bunch of stuff about joints and, you know, how do you do that? Okay, so that's a kind of binding problem. You have to bind your motor abilities to the things you just discovered. Okay, but it's not the same kind of binding problem. You're, you know, you're moving, critical, critical thing, you're moving bindings. You're not just fixing them, you're, you're taking information and moving it from one place to another. Another one that I like is if you go and you go someplace and you drive away in a rental car. So you've got certain kind of driving ability and you've got to bind that to this new car and, you know, what kind of shifter does it have and, and you do that, right? Now the ones that we're, we can really do more uh, work on is things like language. Okay, so, you know, all men are mortal and all that sort of stuff. And another thing that we're going to deal with, which is a little more sort of techie language stuff, is called unification. So you can say uh, one cows, and it's not English. You can say either one or two sheep, and it's fine. And the, the trick is that the binding rule says these two have to have the same number. So unification is a rule that says these two have to have the same number and therefore the value you have for this fixes the value for that. It's a very big deal in uh, language and theorem proof and so forth. You want to be able to bind entities before they have values. So it's just a rule of English that a number and the following noun have to have the same uh, grammatical number. And we'll see in a minute that it's a much bigger deal for me because uh, last couple decades I've mainly been working on a neural theory of language. And uh, this, I, I'm not going to bother you with all of this, but the idea is you really want to build a model of, of language which is neurally plausible. This is a big hole. So no one has anything like a good theory of variable binding. 
and I'll show you some bad theories, including mine. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing you want to do. You have language coming in and some grammar and all that sort of stuff. According to us, there's an analysis process that produces some kind of link structure. Now you can't read this, but the next slide will be something you can almost read. Uh, and it's the semantic specification. And then in our story, uh, the meaning is done by simulation, by imagination and stuff like that. And uh, you, so we depict that as um, Harry walking into the cafe and you actually, he actually walks in. This is a run of our current system on understanding language. Again, the details are not something I can go through in the time we have, but what I want you to notice is all of these little red squares. Okay, so this is the grammar. It says there's an event and there was a motion along a path, etc. But the point here is that the protagonist was also the thing moved. It was the direct trajectory. So if it, this was a sentence like stop moving or robot one stop moving, if we stop one, if robot one stop moving the box, then the mover uh, would not be the trajectory because you're moving something else. So the language is able to deal all with this. Stop, you've got two verbs. So this says the profiled participant in the stopping event is also the profiled participant in the moving event. If it said robots one stop robot two from moving, then the stopper is different than the, okay. So the language stuff can build all this. And the thing is, these are all unifications. And they don't, you, you, it has nothing inherently to do with which words are involved. You don't know what the instances are. You have to be able to do this. So that's what we don't know how to do. Okay, now let me tell you how we don't know how to do it. Okay. So uh, this is a reference resolution if there's a pronoun and stuff. Uh, general language understanding, planning, uh, counterfactuals. a huge range of things which involve this ability and no one knows how to do it. I mean, people do it, but we don't know how to. Okay, there's several proposals. Uh, let me just put them all up. Okay, and there's a, a reasonably good paper uh, by John Hummel uh, fairly recently, Connection Science. Okay, so you can suppose you want to do this. Well, you could imagine crossbars. So you, have, you can make a neural net that had everything that had to be connected on one side and on the other side and just activate the connections. And there's certain things you can do this way, but not nearly enough. Okay, so you know, a new person comes into the room and you, you've got to somehow uh, get them into the possible people that would ask a question. Ain't going to work. Uh, you could, uh, there's a lot of work been done, uh, not so much recently, on uh, signature propagation. So imagine a neural network that had all of the relations, and what you do is you actually pass a bit pattern along this network. So if, uh, whatever it is, uh, John uh, bought a book and he now owns it, then you somehow pass the bit patterns for John and book and owns and stuff, and that's the way you do it. Uh, no one has, has actually made a plausibility argument for that. Uh, you know, it takes like, 20 bits worth of information. We don't, nobody knows how to do that. Uh, and this unifying thing like I showed you, uh, no one has, knows how to do that. So the punchline of a lot of this is, well, you could use temporal synchrony. And that's been the uh, sort of standard for a long time. Okay? And this goes back partly to the stuff we talked about at the beginning. Uh, there was a whole movement involving Singer and Malzberg, and Malzberg since moved to Frankfurt, and they, anyway, it's all very complicated. Uh, but the, uh, and this, as you'll see on the next couple slides, uh, was mainly pushed by uh, Lokendra Shastri. Uh, and this was the uh, most quoted paper. Again, uh, probably a couple thousand citations. Very, by far the best known paper on the variable binding problem. And this is here just to give you a feeling for the mess. Uh, and you, you, I'll, I'll go through the details of how this works in the next couple slides. This is just kind of a gestalt. Uh, the idea is you make these various kinds of nodes and uh, you, activation is going to be the game. Nodes are some group of, you know, quote neurons. And the idea is synchrony is going to be the key. 
So the strong claim about oscillations and stuff is that they were sufficiently powerful so that you could separate out different variables as different phases in the network. And this was worked on a lot. Okay. Uh, there was, uh, at this point, I claim the evidence against that really being how it works is sort of overwhelming. So it's a nice, very clean idea, very pretty idea. It was Malzberg's original idea. Shastri and also some other people worked very hard to build models and relate them to the hippocampus and mm, lots of stuff. But uh, I don't believe this. I, I don't know, think Shastri does either at this point. So what I'm going to do next is go through uh, two slides that are a little more technical on how this story goes. And then I'm going to go on to uh, a newer thing that we did that solves the main problems with this, but also can't be right. So, but we'll get there. Okay, so this, this will take us a few minutes to go through. The notion is this. Over here, we have uh, things, uh, book, Tom, owns, buys, etc. Okay? Now, the notion, notice that this has a question, this is a plus, etc. So a question, if you want to ask, uh, does Tom own this book? Okay, you would uh, activate uh, book, Tom, and owns. All right. And then the flow through the network, which I'll sh show you on the next slide, uh, if all things go well, would come up with a binding that says, ah, we know that he bought the books, therefore he owns it. So this is, this is then an implementation of, of a general fact that somebody buys something, they own it. Which isn't completely true, but this is you know, just the example. So the notion is, these are the phases. Okay, so you have a clock, and this sort of uh, hexagonal thing, uh, I'm sorry, not a hexagon, uh, rhomboid of some sort? Trapezoid. Trapezoid. Okay. Uh, anyway, so this is a kind of uh, f fat grain clock, and these are fine grain sub things. So there's the clock cycle, main clock cycle, and within that you have the phases. And the basic idea is that what you're doing here is, is questioning whether uh, he owns it. So that Tom is sort of the first argument, and the second argument is uh, the book, particular book. So does, does this person own that book? Okay, and the way the firing goes is that that propagates for a while, and suppose there were something in the memory that said uh, this person had bought that book, so it's the same phase, then propagation would work so that after a certain number of backward propagations, you would get also a hit on the fact that uh, he does own it. So let me go on to the next network. We can come back if we want. So this is a simplified version of the thing I slowed you on the first side about how it actually works. So you can imagine a structure like this, which has owning link to buying in a general way. So if any, I think X owns, uh, buys something Y, it owns it. If you want to know whether it might own it, you activate the question node, which activates this, which goes on, looks in memory to see if there's one of these. If there is, and it's in phase, it activates the plus thing. I say, yeah, that's true. And then you, this propagates to here, and then that propagates there, and you have the binding that you want. This guy owns the book. Okay, and over here, this is some stuff about your uh, other things in the data structure. You have, uh, you know, things that are instances. You also can put in quantifiers. Uh, you can put in numerical values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the uh, party line on that. And as there's been a ton of work on this, uh, much you know, if I go back two slides. Okay, this is more like what it really looks like and these complicated things and all that stuff. All right, so, oh, 
So this is the paper we did a few years ago. <laughs> I had been looking at this for years and I finally uh, coerced some students to actually implement it. So there's a complicated implementation, probably worse than Shooty. But here's the idea. There's a standard story in computer science that any problem can be solved by adding a level of indirection. Okay, so that's what we did. So instead of trying to propagate these big 20-some uh, bit things, we said, why don't we just tr assume that since you can only keep 7 plus or minus 2 things in mind, why don't we propagate little short things around? We'll call them fluids. Okay, and they play a role similar to the time slices, but without a bunch of the constraints. It's sort of biologically uh, a bit more plausible. And then there's a binder that maps fluids to particular items, particular books and people. And again, these are the items that fired in the time splice. And the circuits are even worse. And, uh, you know, they're roughly three bits, but you don't need temporal synchrony. There's a reference. And let me go on. So there's a demo which I'm not going to uh, torture you with but I'll give you some ideas. So it, it, it does relatively complicated things. You know, if something's big and can bite, is, is it scary? And there's, we know that dogs can bite, and uh, Fido's a big, big and he's a dog, you know, is Fido scary? Uh, and what happens, again, I don't want you to try to make too much sense out of this. This is the kind of network that you would do in our scheme down here, instead of having time slices, you have these little fluids. So uh, if uh, Fido is number one and Scary is number five, I guess, uh, you try to figure out by inference through all this mess whether you have an information that Fido is scary. And you do. And again, uh, this is uh, you know, 20 slides later through propagation. Uh, or 20 steps through the demo, and you get the same kind of thing that you uh, do with the time slices, but you don't depend on this delicate thing. Oh, is that all? Okay, so let me summarize this before we go on to the last uh, point. Okay, so the idea is that it's a problem so this is number three on your cheat sheet, okay? It's a problem that is terribly important for any kind of attempt to build a neurally plausible story about language and planning and so forth. If it must be solvable. It isn't like the mind-brain problem or something. You know, there's computations that go on. Nobody has a decent idea of how to do it. There are a number of proposals and, you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you that it's pretty implausible. Okay, the reason we worked it out was A, to see if it could, and also then to provide another kind of dimension in thinking space that, that someone might, you know, figure out how to actually get it right. So no one actually believes any of these are right, or even, you know, sort of partly right and can be tuned. So this is the problem that's interesting, and that's why I care about the, uh, the business about the binding problem. Sorry? Yeah, sure. Before you move on, yeah. um, how would you classify, or how, does, how, how do uh, these approaches fit into your, what you just told us, that use these high dimensional representations like holographic? Yeah, so that's, yeah. So that's uh, back at the beginning, that's a good point. The uh, Hummel paper talks about this in detail. They don't work. Okay, these work and they're, they're implausible. The holographic things don't work. You can't add new items. There's a whole bunch of things you can't do. They don't actually do variables well at all. Okay, so there, there, there's, right, there's another literature uh, on holographic things. Very little of that still is, is, is alive. So there was, a, there was a period when people built uh, tensor product things and stuff like that. Uh, there's a gentleman there who did a lot of that. Uh, but I, as far as I know, no, there's no, been no attempt to, to actually extend this to the variable case. And, and what's the flaw with uh, your system? It's just too complex. I mean, it gets very hairy and stuff like that. And to ask the, the ner and you learn a new thing. There's a recruiting story about how you might put new nodes in and stuff. But I, I don't believe it. 
<laughs> Are these all localist representations? Uh, they, semi-localist. So another long story in the, in the connectionist business is this distributed versus local. That has been resolved in the following political way. The people talk about sparse distributed representations. It's exactly what Bruno talks about. Okay, so if you talk about sparse distributed representations, then n no localist ever said it was one neuron. Uh, no uh, distributed person said it was the whole brain. And if it's a sparse distributed representation, there's nothing to argue about. So they don't, which is good. Um, okay, so th this is the final uh, piece of the story, but I do want to talk about this a bit because it also uh, matters to me, and I'll show you why. Uh, so first of all, we did our vote already, and, and uh, almost everybody agrees that uh, the mind-brain problem is a mystery. Now, here's a complication, which is the visual feature binding stuff, and all these experiments all re uh, require subjective reports. So you could say that they're getting at the same mind-brain problem because you're making a subjective report. Of course, that way lies chaos, but people do it. Okay, so the fact that you can predict that you know a certain thing is better explained by by two feature binding doesn't get you anywhere with regard to the general problem of mind and brain. But there are a lot of things that are written, including that thing I'm sending around, uh, in which people muddle these things. So it's not at all common. And there are people who muddle the uh, number one, saying, well. You know, uh, synchronization is clearly important in the, the unity of perception. True. Okay. But it doesn't tell you anything. I mean, yeah. Okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't give you any purchase at all on the core problem. So that's part of why there's so much confusion. So, uh, again, these are the, I think, standard philosophers for this. Uh, Chalmers calls this the hard problem. Then it's on the side that it's no problem. Okay, and John Searle calls it consciousness. Uh, and what, the reason it's important to me is because I'm worried about this neural theory of language. And if I had to account for the mind-body problem as well, I'm out of business. I mean, I, I, I have nothing to say. So I have to explicitly say, hey, this is something that's intractable. And therefore, I shouldn't be responsible for making my theory of language do that. I showed you before that there's a problem that's perfectly tractable that I can't solve. Okay, and that, that's my bit. I also have to do that. Now, I want to do one more thing, partly because this is an opportunity to do it. Uh, a particular version of the uh, mind-brain problem is one that has uh, bothered me for a long time. And... The point is, you know, you talk about consciousness. Who the hell knows what that is? Okay, so you say we don't have an explanation of consciousness. We don't even know what consciousness is. But what I'm going to suggest is that the illusion of a stable visual world is something that we all experience every time we open our eyes. And we now know enough to know that there is no neurally plausible implementation of it. So let me put up this, which you all know. This is Stuart Anstis thing. And this is a sort of V1 story of the resolution of uh, the visual system. So something out that far would have to be that big in order to be as well resolved as something there closer to the fovea. Fact. Now, here you are, and you're all seeing an illusion that you've got this whole scene in full resolution and... Uh, you know, pretty broad field. Okay, and what I'm suggesting is this wasn't so clear 30 years ago when I first started looking at this, but now we know enough about the visual system to know there isn't any place that could hold a full high-resolution uh, image of everything you think you see. So this, from my point of view, is a crucial leverage point on the mind-brain problem. Because we know perfectly well what's going on. We know what the phenomenology is. And we know that none, no story that we have involving neurons and neuron firing and synchronization and stuff is going to get you an implementation of it. So uh, 
that's sort of the end and, and time for discussion. Uh, but let me just add one final thing, which is every time I tell this story, I get mostly denial. Okay? You know, it just isn't true. There's something, the, the story isn't right, etc. So uh, that's it. And I guess I'll go back to the handout again on the screen so that we can talk about anything. Okay? Anything at all? Oh, I have to get my pencil. So, uh, before you get into the uh, you did promise to tell us what Wolf Singer's new view is. Oh, yeah, his new view is it's everything. So the uh, the old view was this this synchrony was crucial, and it okay. The new view is well maybe not, but if you take synchrony in the broad sense, it's enormously explanatory. Any all the places in the brain where synchrony is important, you know, uh, STDP, uh, uh, you know, event related potentials, and you go on and on and on. Synchrony really is important, but I didn't get out of it anything that was sharp. You know, here's a problem that we now can solve or something. So that's and as far as I can tell, Kelso's story is the same. Uh, but I don't pretend to really understand it. But that's what I got out of it. But yeah, other questions? Let's do it. Sure. Penti. Uh, in our formal systems, the distinction between, between uh, variable and value or role and filler is very, it's very clear. Right. Now, however, in our normal use of language, it's not so clear. And I think we need to think of that. Okay. I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you know the answer, what is the dollar of Mexico? What would be your answer? Well, I mean, I would say peso, but and, and go ahead. I think most people would say, and the thing is that, that now, what is the variable, what's the value? We have used the dollar as the variable, when in, in another sense it is a value. Well, okay. It is, it is sort of the relation what dollar plays in our minds to... Power experience and then and you can So there's this the, the, our brains deal with variables and values more flexibly than our formal systems. Could be. So I, I don't want to drift off onto yet another topic, but the other thing we've been working on low these many years is metaphors. Yeah. And these are also, if you think about it, metaphors are also mappings that involve bindings. So the, uh, the dollar, you know, is to U.S. like uh, the peso is to Mexico. So that's another form of this uh, same binding problem that we also don't know how to solve. Okay. Uh, it, it turns out that... Go ahead. I, I think uh, Hamel dismisses the multiplicative binding too lightly. Okay. And because this kind of thing can be handled with the multiplicative binding. In, in the holographic system. So, fair enough. And, and, and uh, what my point is that the, the, the problem number three, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep mathematical problem. I don't think we can solve it un, until we sort of face this as a mathematical problem of some mathematical space and operations in that space. And I'd say many of, I'd say most of our models so far are more ad hoc than that. So it's a, we, yeah, great, do it. So, yeah. so, so that's that's where I would go, and, and I sort of see Hamel going in that direction. When now he already talks about the additive binding, right? But there's also multiplicity binding, right? And, and there are others. And I think that the holographic models deserve. I mean, they they, they cannot be dismissed. Okay, so great. So would you? Uh, so, so there's, so, there's good. That to be looked at. Good. Would you do this, this for me? Uh, scratch out a note that ex that tells me how you're thinking of uh, tackling this. It's, you now have the slides. It's a pretty well formed problem. Mm -hmm. Send me a note about how you're t thinking of doing it. Be great. Stan. Uh, I haven't heard the word frames. I, I think from the time I'm a little kid, I, I've seen what, what is it? Tom owning a book. I've yeah. seen all these things, and I have frames. I have. 
embodied experiences. Yep, 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 yep. I haven't heard that. Well, let me go back to slide 13, I think. Sl frames all over the place. That's what they are. So there's the motion path frame, and it's got all those rolls, right? Frames as far as the eyes can see. So what's wrong with that? I have these... Yeah, but it's the bindings that, are, that we don't know how to do. So we know what the frames are. But each piece of language specifies different bindings. So if I say move, that means move yourself. If I say move box yeah. two. Right. So it's the bindings that we need to capture in a neurally plausible way. Our code works. We just don't have a neurally plausible story for how the brain does it. Is that all? Okay, in the back. So, I, I have a, I think there's a kind of an incest in uh, artificial intelligence kind of theory and linguistics okay. between your conceptualization of what we're doing and the architecture that you then uh, create to implement that conceptualization. Fair enough. And maybe not to your satisfaction. Maybe, maybe the the uh, maybe the that we have that variable binding hasn't been done to your satisfaction in a distributed architecture. That's fine, but I would say that we're not doing variable binding the way you're, you're even imagining it at, at all. And so I would go back to the early debates between localist and distributed con uh, connectionism, where what they did was say, you know, they produced existence proof. Look, we can do these complicated mappings using distributed representations, and you can go in there and pull out the activity of the nodes in such a way that makes sense to you. And that's what the neuroscientists also find. They can only find neurons like one layer deep that makes sense to us. So I would say the whole thing actually is a big mush, and what it has to be done is that we have to work out, and what we have been doing for 20 years is work out the probabilistic machine learning that will pr produce that mush, rather than trying to uh, uh, replicate the mistakes of 70s and 80s AI. Very good company. Lots of people think that. It's, it's the mainstream now. It is. It's wrong. So let me. So I'll, I'll make you the same offer I made Penty. Sketch out how you think it's, it's going to work to solve the, this. I don't think we're solving variable binding. That's, that's a computer scientist fantasy. No, no. Sorry. No, sorry. You. Computers. Sorry. No. You. You hear a sense. It, it says push something. You got to figure out what it said. You. You push. No choice. We just have. We just have signals flying around. It happens. I mean, it's no, no like, sorry, <laughs> sorry, no, there's you're done. Really big, complicated mush that you can't put your finger on. No. Sorry, that's, that's the way it is. Okay, good. All right, so the, uh, this is the obscurantist proposal. It's not obscure. Okay, but anyway, let, who's next? Who's, who's next? Yeah. yeah, machine learning will do it all, right. Okay, uh, who's next? Somebody else had one. Yeah. Is there, a, can you suggest a correspondence between your fluids and visual features? No. So the, the, the fluids are intended to be a way of abstractly representing whatever it is you need to be bind. bind. So you could imagine that a particular case would be visual features, but it wouldn't actually look any different uh, computationally than if it was something else that you were binding, pronouns or something. So it's a general notion of linking things together that you want to have linked. Okay, we done? Okay, uh, one question. Oh, we're not done. <laughs> that is, uh, how would you uh, approach a neuroscientist uh, with advice on how a neuroscientist might uh, solve the problem? Yeah, so the question is about neuroscience. We have a number of collaborations with neuroscientists, and... Uh, an, an active, I'll give you an idea. So, an active, the most active one now is getting at this question of uh, embodiment and simulation semantics. So, you would expect imaging results that would be consistent with uh, some of these ideas of, of embodied semantics. And uh, we've done some work with people here uh, and other people. So. It's not easy. I mean, there aren't any animal models of language, you know, or anything like that. So it's a lot harder than vision to get decent experiments. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain amount that can be done pretty much uh, at the neuro, you know, neuroscience level, all with uh, imaging, human imaging and stuff. The, the uh, or other kind of imaging, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't... Uh, you know, there are people who are doing evoke potentials and stuff like that. None of that seems to get at the level of grain that 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 uh, is useful in, in 
refining the theory. I don't know how to do it anyway. I guess now we're done. Okay. Thanks, thanks.